Good afternoon, but also good morning and good evening to many of us. It's our pleasure to welcome you to our third webinar in the new series of ITM alumni web webinars featuring the ITM winners of the prize for Global Research 2022. This prize is awarded yearly by the province of Antwerp to research projects of master after master students of ITM and other higher education institutes. Development relevance, quality and originality of the master thesis are key in the selection. Through this award, the province of Antwerp wants to stimulate research relating to the global south. In this third webinar, MSTAH alumna and laureate Claire Julia Congo from Uganda will present her master thesis entitled Prevalence Risk Factors for Exposure and Social Economic Impact of Pest de Petit Ruminant in Karenga District, Karamoja Region, Uganda. In the ITM alumni webinars, ITM alumni share their research finding and expertise on a specific health topic. The main aim of this series of webinars is to share research findings, expertise and experiences on a specific topic within the ITM community of alumni, students, staff, partner institutions and the wider global health community. I will now explain briefly some practicalities of the webinar. If you want to ask a question, you can use the Q&A option you have below your screen. If you want to ask a question in live, you can raise your hand. The chat is being disabled for questions. Questions will be moderated and only a select number of questions can be answered in live, given the limited time. Unanswered questions cannot be answered individually afterwards, for which we apologize. You can, however, use the Q&A, um, the, the, the forum function in the alumni uh, platform to start a discussion on your questions left after the webinar. At the end of the webinar, a short survey will be displayed. Uh, the webinar is being recorded uh, and the recording will be made available afterwards after the webinar. Uh, today, uh, we have two moderators. One of the co-moderators is Veronique Dermau. Veronique is a senior scientific fellow working at the unit of Helminthology at ITM. She is a veterinarian and a statistician. In 2013, she completed her PhD in veterinary sciences, and in 2015, she joined the unit. Her work focuses on zoonetic, helminth, and foodborne infections of veterinary and public health importance. She's involved in several research and capacity strengthening consortia in the South. She's ITM co coordinator for the capacity strengthening DGD ITM South Africa program, as well as topic coordinator in Vietnam, Ethiopia, and DRC programs. Moreover, she's involved in other ongoing research projects, and she's also the ITM director and module coordinator for the MSC Global One Health, uh, which is organized in close collaboration, joint uh, with the University of Pretoria, South Africa. Veronique, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlotte, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, and but there's another uh, moderator, which is uh, who is um, Professor Melvin Kwan. So he's an associate professor at the University of Pretoria. Uh, Melvin is a veterinarian who researched copper deficiency in Lesbok in the Kamdebu National Park for his MSc degree, and then modeled in vi vivo dynamics of foot and mouth disease virus in pigs at the Purbright Institute and the University of Edinburgh for his PhD degree. He returned to under support in 2005 and worked on rapid diagnostic assays and the molecular epidemiology of African horse sickness virus. His current research interest is on the rapid diagnostics of viruses of veterinary importance. Melvin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Veronique. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Claire. Um, so Claire is a veterinarian. Uh, she graduated from Makarere University in Uganda in 2017, um, and she pursued then a Master's of Science in Tropical Animal Health at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, uh, where she did the study that will be discussed today. Um, so she's a veterinary epidemiologist, and her current work involves epidemiological studies 
of transboundary and zoonotic diseases, as well as design and implementation of disease surveillance and control programs. Over to you, Claire. Thank you. Exposure and socioeconomic impacts of PPR in Karenga District, the Karamoja region in Uganda. Uh, my presentation will give a brief background to the topic. Then I'll highlight the methods used and the results obtained. I'll further discuss my findings and give the conclusions drawn and the recommendations made. So PPR is a disease of mainly goats and sheep caused by the small ruminant mobili virus. Uh, the, virus the virus is important trophic and epitheliotrophic, and animals that are affected present with signs including high-grade fever, depression, painful, er er painful erosive oral lesions that prevent the animals from eating, uh, resulting in severe weight loss. Uh, animals affected also present with ocular and nasal discharges, severe pneumonia, and profuse diarrhea. PPR is ranked as one of the most important transboundary livestock diseases, especially in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and is associated with high morbidity and mortality rates. It is estimated that over two thirds of the world's sheep and goat population are at risk of being infected with the small ruminant mobility virus. And with uh, an estimated $2 billion US dollars lost annually due to the disease, it affects the livelihoods of over 300 million farmers globally. And it is for this reason that the World Organization for Animal Health has identified it and listed it as the next disease that we are looking forward to eradicating by the year 2030. So controlling PPR requires a good understanding of the epidemiological status and socioeconomic impact of the disease in a range of geographical locations and management systems and area specific information is critical to the design of interventions to control PPR. Uh, previous reports in Uganda estimate prevalences of PPR at 57.6 and 1.4% in other parts of Karamoja and between 1.9 to 9.4% in the rest of Uganda. Um, Karenga districts presents a unique PPR epidemiological situation as it borders South Sudan and hosts the Kidepo Valley National Park. Um, it is usually characterized by uncontrolled cross-border livestock movement between Karenga and, and parts of South Sudan with communal grazing and informal marketing of livestock. Uh, despite the fact that some prevalence information for the other regions of Karamoja are available, at the time of the study, Karenga district did not have any information concerning PPR epidemiology, and this made it hard for us to push for the control of the disease in the district. The aim of this study was therefore to obtain a better understanding of the epidemiological situation of PPR in Karenga district as well as the impact of the disease on the livelihoods of small ruminant farmers. And the objectives were to determine the seroprevalence of anti-SRM antibodies in goats and sheep in Karenga district using the competitive enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay uh, to establish the risk factors associated with the occurrence and spread of PPR in Karenga and to determine the socioeconomic impact of PPR among communities in the district using participatory epidemiology. So the study was conducted in Karenga district, which is located in the Karamoja region in the northeastern part of Uganda. It is mainly inhabited by the pastoralists who are mainly Kar the Karamojong tribe whose livelihoods greatly depend on livestock and cattle, goats, sheep, and donkeys are kept in the pastoral system. So this study 
This study employed a cross-sectional design with two-stage cluster sampling in which 22 crowds were selected randomly from all administrative, administrative units in Karenga district. And from each of the selected crowds between 28 to 35 goats and sheep were selected using the systematic random sampling. Uh, for the determination of prevalence and risk factors for exposure to PPR in Karenga district, Blood samples were collected from 684 goats and sheep by systematic random sampling in the herds, and the serum obtained was analyzed using the competitive enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. For each of the selected animals, records of age, sex, uh, vaccination status, uh, management system, and, and other related information were captured to help with the analysis of risk, risk factors. Uh, to establish the socioeconomic impact of PPR, the study employed participatory epidemiology, which is defined as the involvement of communities in defining and prioritizing veterinary or health related problems and in the design of of solutions to service delivery, surveillance, and control. Uh, the approaches applied here included observation, semi-structured interviews, and scoring and ranking. For observation, we conducted clinical examination of all the selected animals for signs suggestive of PPR. Uh, for semi-structured interviews, we interviewed 50 small ruminant farmers as well as 15 key informants, which included opinion leaders, crowd leaders, and animal health service providers in the district. And for scoring and ranking, visual tools, including simple ranking, pairwise ranking, proportional piling for morbidity and mortality, and disease impact matrix scoring were used in, in focus group discussions with 22 groups of small ruminant farmers each group comprising of between eight to 12 participants. And moving on to the results, uh, out of 684 animals examined, 24.3% exhibited signs suggestive of PPR, and the most common signs observed included profuse diarrhea, mucolent nasal discharge, and oral lesions. Um, uh, Hards in Capedo, presented animals with the highest proportions showing signs of PPR, while Karenga Town Council and Lokori had the animals presenting with the lowest proportion of animals presenting with signs of PPR. Um, out of a total of 684 serum samples ex analyzed by ELISA, 334 turned a positive results yielding an apparent prevalence of 48.8% and a true prevalence of 51.4%. Uh, the final multivariable logistic regression identified location, animal species, and age as being the risk factors for exposure to PPR in Karenga districts. Uh, locations including Kapedo, Kawalakol, and Sangar had the highest number of animals presenting positive results. Uh, while the odds of exposure was higher in sheep than goats and also higher in older animals than the younger ones. Uh, interviews with small ruminant farmers revealed that communal grazing and watering of goats and sheep was common in all locations. However, animals were separated by species and age group by most of the respondents all of the respondents were aware of PPR, but only 6% were aware of its control or even its mechanism of transmission. PPR case management was largely through trial and error in which only about 72% of the respondents treated the animals by themselves, while 24% accessed the services of community animal health workers and only 4% had access to paravets or qualified veterinarians. And the cost of treatment for PPR ranged between 1.5 to 5.5 US dollars. Uh, all the respondents indicated that there has not been any vaccination or, 
again, it's PPR or any other disease of small ruminants for the past three years. Um, on small ruminant trade, 82% uh, of the respondents indicated that they traded in lives in small ruminant animals to emit to, to meet immediate household needs, including um, payment of medical bills and school fees, as well as for nutrition purposes, while only 18% engaged in small ruminant business as a major source of income. Um, marketing of small ruminants was done both within the locality and also in other locations, including other districts, other regions, as well as other countries like South Sudan and Kenya. And in all these marketing places, there was no inspection of the animals by a qualified veterinarian. Um, animals that were taken to market and returned and sold were reintroduced to, to the herds without any quarantine period observed. The price of a healthy animal, less than six months old, ranged between 2.7 and 12.5 US dollars, while that of an 22.2 and 36.1 US dollars. Uh, in the case of animals suffering from PPR or suspected to be suffering from PPR, um, there was no sale that could be made and then on, sev on, on very rare occasions, they would sell them between 12.5 and 22.21 US dollars, representing a price drop of between 56.3 and 61.5%. Pairwise ranking of small ruminants identified PPR as the third commonest disease of small ruminants in Karenga districts after contagious caprine pyrrhonemonia and anaplasmosis. Uh, the overall annual annual illness in goat and sheep herds in Karenga district was at 69.5%. Then PPR was ranked second after CC. Looks like we're having a small technical problem. Um, Claire has, we've lost Claire. So let's wait for one or two minutes. The time she will come back uh, when her internet connection, of course, will allow. Our apologies that are, of course, the technical, yes, issues sometimes we are facing. Thank you for your patience. We will get back to you straight away, hopefully.
Welcome back, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, well, maybe um, for um, internet reasons. Uh, okay. Yes, and maybe you switch, you leave your video off. Maybe that could help. I've now connected with my phone internet. Ah, great. Okay, perfect. Internet. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, um, sorry about that. Okay, so um, we were presenting about the impact of the, of PPR. So the um, the impact of diseases of small ruminants in Karenga district were mostly attributed to high treatment costs, high mortality rates, and low marketability of affected animals. And PPR was second to CCPP in terms of mortality rates and effects of marketability. Uh, the disease was ranked as the highest cause of conflicts among communities in the district. And this is mostly because it is transmitted or spread through sharing of resources, including watering points and grazing grounds. Other impacts of the disease included lowered status of farmers in the communities. In the Karemojong culture, status is is linked with the number of animals one owns. And if diseases like PPR cause high mortality rates in the livestock, it results in reduction in the number of livestock one owns and ultimately the reduction in the status of the farmer in the communities. Also animals that were affected by PPR were considered as, at not, as not being suitable for payment of bride price and for use in traditional rituals that are commonly performed in the, in the societies. Um, interviews with key informant interviews revealed that PPR was a common occurrence in Karenga district and had significant impacts on livelihoods of the affected farmers. Um, five of the key informants were aware of recent outbreaks of the disease and these were mostly recorded in areas of Kapedo, Kawalakol and Sangar that are bordering the that share a common border usually with South Sudan and other districts in the Karamoja region where PPR has also been reported. However, none of them was aware of the number of animals that were affected, but they all agreed that control of PPR was a multi-stakeholder responsibility and that government, private sector, and NGOs should co coordinate well in order to control the disease in the district. Um, they hinted that the last vaccination against PPR was done in the year 2017, and this was made possible by with support of the UN FAO. But the vaccination coverage was as unknown as this information was not made available to the stakeholders. Uh, the challenges to control of PPR in Karenga districts included low technical capacity for surveillance, outbreak investigation and reporting of the disease due to understaffing of the, of the veterinary department and low number of community animal health workers trained. Uh, also in inadequate capacity building for the existing personnel hindered surveillance and control of PPR in Karenga districts. The key informants also noted that there were low incentives to attract private vets to the districts and the region as a whole to bridge the service delivery gaps. Other challenges included lack of prioritization of animal disease control programs as evidenced by the lag in, va the lag in vaccination of animals against PPR and other important livestock diseases. Additionally, uh, cultural practices, including raids and migrations, also undermined current efforts to control the diseases as animals have to be followed to wherever they migrate. And this poses a challenge, especially in transportation of vaccines and maintenance of the cold chain. 
uh, the prevalence of PPR reported in this study is similar to those reported in other locations in northern Karamoja, but it is much lower than those reported in southern Karamoja and other areas of Uganda. This can be attributed to the livestock, the high livestock population in Karenga district and other districts in the northern part of Karamoja region. And coupled with the community communal grazing, this encourages overcrowding and increases contact of infected animals with susceptible animals. Uh, the anti-SRM antibodies identified in this in this study were as a result of natural infection with the PPR virus and um, not due to vaccination or maternal immunity because uh, our study did not sample animals that were less than six months old and none of the sampled animals had had previous history of vaccination against PPR. Uh, the presence of PPR in all locations in the district points to endemicity of the disease in Karenga district. Um, the higher prevalences in areas like Kapedo, Kawalakol, and Sangar can be attributed to the uncontrolled livestock transboundary movement in, in those areas that border South Sudan, Kotido, and Kabong districts where high prevalences of PPR have been reported. While those areas that, that had low prevalence of PPR bordered districts like Hitgum district in which Livestock keeping is not, is not widely practiced and PPR is not a concern. Uh, higher prevalence of PPR in sheep than goats can be attributed to the higher survival rates in sheep as other studies have reported that, the, that sheep exhibited higher survival rates and there were low mortality rates in the sheep population than the goats population. And the uh, affected goats usually die off, uh, leaving the sheep that have survived and these develop um, lifelong immunity to PPR and, and, and have detectable levels of PPR antibodies. So this study highlighted that age, age is a, a risk factor for exposure to PPR and this can be, this can be justified by the fact that in that passive immunity to PPR wanes off at, at three months. And then as the animal grows, it increases the risk for infection. And then this can also be attributed to the longevity of, of animals in the herd as, as older animals get to have more exposure time in the herd and therefore increases their risk for infection. Uh, the socioeconomic impacts of PPR reported in this study are likely to increase poverty and disrupt social functions in the district and increase inequalities as well as the need for dependence on aid. And this directly impacts on the attainment of the sustainable development goals. Uh, we conclude that there is a relatively high prevalence of small ruminant mobility virus in Karenga district. And the risk factors for exposure includes location, animal species, and age. Uh, PPR is the second most important disease of small ruminants in Karenga district, and it is widespread and endemic in the district. Uh, the disease directly impacts food security and livelihoods development. Uh, our recommendations to the district leadership as well as other stakeholders were to increase effective stakeholder sensitization about PPR and then build capacity, build capacity for long-term impact of vaccination, including vaccine delivery, monitoring, and quality control. PPR control should be linked with control of other diseases, including contagious caprine pneumonia for a wider impact as these diseases also prevent, present a big challenge to animal production in Karenga district. The feasibility of course recovery can be exploited through groups and, associate, and associations of livestock keepers. Um, we also recommend that surveillance of PPR in the wild should be done to monitor virus maintenance in the wild as this phenomenon is not clearly understood and more research needs to be done. 
It is also important to establish incentives to attract qualified veterinarians to work in the areas and to bridge the service delivery gap that exists. So I acknowledge the Institute of Tropical and Tropical Medicine, uh, the University of Pretoria, the district's local government of Karenga, and the College of Veterinary Medicine, Animal Resources and Biosecurity in Makere University for supporting this study, as well as the DGD for, for funding the study and the pastoralist for, avail for availing their animals. I also thank my supervisors, Dr. Charles Biaruhanga, Dr. Melvin, Melvin Kwan, and my colleagues, Mr. Stephen Kakoza, Mr. Joshua ogen and my interpreter in the field, Ms. Lona Lolem. I thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Claire. Maybe the moderators, uh, yes, here they are, Veronique and Melvin. Uh, voila, the floor is yours uh, to launch uh, the discussion. Thank you. Maybe I, Very yes? Yeah, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, maybe just to kick start the discussion, I have more general questions because I'm not a to topic expert. Um, so as you know, um, Claire, um, the WOAH, <laughs> the new name for OIE and FAO, they're very keen to eliminate this disease by 2030. Um, and they are quite confident that they can do that due to the similarities um, in terms of disease um, of uh, with rinderpest. Um, so based on, on your study and, and what you've learned about this virus, how far do you think we are in eliminating it? Yes, um, I am aware that the World Organization animal health aims at eradicating PPR by 2030 and there is a global eradication program that is already ongoing. Um, different countries are in different stages of the eradication process um, and none of them is like already at the, at the eradication stage. Uganda specifically is at stage two of the eradication process which is institution of control mechanisms. Um, interaction with different stakeholders. Yes, mo most of them are really optimistic that this can be achieved only if we do rigorous vaccination of livestock and if government and other stakeholders really support this eradication process because we have a very effective vaccine that provides immunity for at least three years after vaccination. So if all livestock are vaccinated, then we can be sure that this can be eradicated by 2030. Okay, and um, maybe something about the mode of transmission. Yeah, you mentioned it very briefly, I think. So, but could you explain a little bit more how, how this um, virus is being transmitted and why it is indeed exactly in those marketplaces that a lot of transmission can occur? Yes, um, PPR is usually transmitted by, by contacts with infected animals and um, all, all bodily discharges, including the feces, um, mucus, can can have viable virus, can, can have via, viable virus that can be transmitted from one infected animal to another. So, at the drinking points when animals gather and congregate together, that is a way that it can be transmitted, and also at the grazing grounds. 
However, uh, research shows that the virus is very unstable outside the host because of the lipid envelope structure that can be easily destroyed by heat and um, organic solvents. So if so there is that argument that people have that the disease cannot survive an outside the animal host for greater than four hours. Yeah. So if you're not in the immediate vicinity of an infected animal, you cannot, the, the other animals cannot be infected. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Claire, for your presentation. Um, so in, in the presentation, the prevalence um, in the Karamoja district was very high. It was 50% versus the rest of the country, which is 1%. Um, and then you had a table about um, where you had the prevalence in each sub-county. And that varied a lot as well. Um, can you explain this variation in the prevalence in different parts of the country, this heterogeneity? Okay, so um, just to give us a brief history of PPR in the country. Um, so even if PPR was first reported in the Ivory Coast in the year 1942 in Uganda, our first report came in 2007 in the Moroto district, which is located in Karamoja region. And most most, most information tells us that this could be probably due to transboundary movement of livestock between South Sudan and Uganda and Kenya and Uganda. Um, the differences with, between Karamoja region and other regions of the country mostly lies in the livestock production system. Uh, in the Karamoja region, it is mostly agro-pastoral and in some parts it is the pastoral system where and where farmers move with their livestock from place to place, like from Karamoja to other regions or within the Karamoja region, but in different districts, looking for water and pasture. And this movement is usually seasonal. And they are usually, they, they are big dams in certain places where all animals congregate, especially in the dry season. And that is something that facilitates transmission of diseases because people come all the way from Turkana in Kenya to, to Kobebe Dam in Moroto district and other districts of Karamoja. While in the other parts of Uganda, most of the farms are usually settled and there's that, can I say, there's reduced um, contact between different animals from different farms. So there's limited interaction between different herds. So it's basically the transboundary movement and the congregation of livestock in different places, the unregulated live animal trade. However, um, right now in Uganda, there has been an increasing trend of, um, of transmission of PPR in the southwestern part of Uganda, even though it is not so similar to Karamoja, there are still other factors, including um, and I say movement, especially livestock trade where animals are bought from the Karamoja region and introduced to districts in the south due to probably government programs and other NGOs distributing animals. And these animals are not initially screened for the disease. So you've seen a shift from Karamoja to the southwestern part in the recent period. Okay, thank you, Claire. Can you see the the Q and A's. Mm, yes, I can. So there's a question from Elizabeth um, on how to identify depression in sheep and goats. Um, she's not a vet, so she's just like, how do you recognize a depressed animal? <laughs> depression, sheep and goats. Yes. Um, in animals generally, of course, animals will not tell you that I, I feel depressed or I'm feeling low today, but you can, you can identify this by observing their demeanor, especially an animal that was usually 
and I say most of our animals are usually gregarious, but a depressed animal is going to isolate itself from the rest of the herd, and then it's not eating, probably it is with the, the head bowed low, then you can think this animal is depressed and it's usually unthrifty. So animals are usually active, they, they graze, they interact with the others, but a depressed animal will usually isolate itself and it's not active. Yes. Uh, she's got a follow-up question um, on zoonoses. And is there much awareness among the general population on zoonoses? Um, and in case of low awareness, what could be some contextual barriers? Okay, just to clarify, PPR is not a zoonotic disease, but to answer that question, um, at this point, I can't tell where there is whether there is much awareness among the general population on zoonosis. It depends much on the category of people you're, you're speaking about and uh, the geographical locations. I've been involved in um, awareness creation on Rift Valley fever and um, tenia, teniasis. Uh, yeah, in certain locations, people know that these diseases exist. But the challenge comes to understanding how it is transmitted. Like how do people get these diseases and what can we do to control or prevent the disease? Uh, like the recent outbreak of Rift Valley fever in the Western part of the country, we, the, okay. Most people did not know where the, the diseases came from, but they just heard that there was a death due to Rift Valley fever. So we had to come in and inform them of how the disease is spread, how they can protect themselves and the role livestock play in the transmission cycle. So it really depends on the context. Okay, thanks. I think Benedict has a question. Benedict. Hello, hi Claire. Hi Benedict. Nice to see you and nice to see everybody been long. <laughs> so uh, that was a very good presentation, Claire. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I just have a few things, uh, maybe two or three things I wanted to ask. One is uh, Karenga region has very high prevalence, like you've highlighted, and even in literature. And one of the things you've highlighted is, one is because of the location. It is, it is neighboring South Sudan and Kenya. But I'm just wondering, you you did um, you uh, what about you? You've said vaccination works, but vaccination seems slow in that region. What is the vaccination coverage in other regions? I didn't hear it in other areas of Uganda. If it's a factor, uh, if if it's working, why is the coverage of vaccination higher in other regions? That is why it's lower than Karenga or what is the coverage of vaccination in other regions? Uh, while you think of that, you talked about um, sheep having um, higher prevalence than goats and your reason was the survival rates, which I uh, personally I wouldn't say it's conclusive because that doesn't talk much about susceptibility uh, between sheep and goats. Uh, is, are they are there variation in terms of how susceptible they are to the disease? And is this something to do with their geno genomes or, I don't know, genetics? Or I don't know, it's, it's something I would have also wished to hear. And then the last thing is, although the cells drop, just out of curiosity, why do people buy? Because did you maybe interview any of people who buy them? and? Because you said you can't use them for bread price and other other things, so why would you buy an infected them? Just out of curiosity. Thank you. Thank you, Benedict. Um, vaccination coverage in Karenga district and in other areas. Yes. Um, at the time of the study, uh, we we were informed 
that there has not been any vaccination against PPR since 2017, and that, that is like three years past. Um, probably the most hindrance to vaccination in Karenga district and other parts of Uganda is majorly the availability of the vaccines. Sometimes the, the doses procured are not enough to cover the whole country or even the whole district. So usually they, they receive the vaccines upon request from the district veterinary officer. But in the case of Karenga district, the district had only one animal health personnel in the district who is not even a qualified veterinarian, but is a paravet and he's supposed to be based in one single sub county. And, but because of the um, service delivery gap, he's, he's now handling the whole district and probably he does not know the modalities of how to request for these vaccines from the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, in other areas, it's the same story. Vaccine is not available to cover all animal populations. But what we are doing right now in Uganda is uh, risk-based vaccination because we understand the doses are few, but we have identified areas that are at higher risks. So most of the vaccine doses are now being channeled to those areas to help cover some of the more susceptible animals. Um, sheep being prevalence in sheep being higher than goats. Uh, yes, in this time, prevalence was higher in sheep than goats. Uh, as I said, um, from other literature, it is said that sheep, sheep have higher survival rates to, of PPR than goats. Um, but none of them has mentioned any specific uh, genetic or pre predisposing factors in the sheep that makes them more and I say more resilient than the goats. That is an area that needs to be explored more by, through, through research. Um, animals, sick animals being bought. Yeah, why do people buy infected animals? Uh, unfortunately, I did not interview livestock traders in this study, but from interaction with the communities, I know that usually people go ahead and buy sick animals because at this rate they are selling them at lower rates than they would in a normal animal. So people usually take advantage of that and them knowing that PPR is not zoonotic, they find it, they think, they don't think there is any problem with buying an infected animal. All I think what we need to do is to sensitize them because when, once you buy an infected animal and you transport it through several can I say along the way you, you spread the disease through the, the discharges from the, from the animal, the feces and all those other things. So there's need to sensitize the traders of which that is an area that we are focusing right now. We have embarked on um, sensitization programs that is targeting several people that are involved in the small ruminant value chain. Thank you. I think there's a question from Welder Gabriel, um, and he's going to ask it live. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I have some few. First, I appreciate the good presentation and the good work as well. Uh, I need some clarifications. Uh, I'm in which I, I can start with uh, uh, how is the PPR cause conflict among the communities? It would be good if you can clarify this. You say it's one of the major causes of conflicts. Yeah. Uh, second, how did you select the disease for the ranking in the proportional piling and other matrices? For example, in Ethiopia, in pastoral communities, uh, we see that uh, folks sheep and goat box, anthrax, and orpha, so some other major diseases. But I see on your ranking, CCPP, pyroplasma, trips, and so on. So how did you select this disease with PPR for ranking? Okay. Uh, did you make some survey to select these top diseases, maybe? 
uh, other uh, it would be important. maybe sorry to interrupt you but Gabriel, maybe claire can already start with those and then we'll see where we get uh, in terms of time thank you for your questions okay. well, okay, i have yeah. some more so i'll just quickly address it okay yeah. how does ppr cause conflicts yes some community members already got to know that sharing of drinking points and grazing areas can 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 I say can facilitate can facilitate the transmission of PPR from infected animals to susceptible animals. So when a, when the community identifies that a certain farmer has animals that are infected with PPR or are suffering from PPR, they usually tend to deny access to the water sources for that specific farm. And because we have limited areas where people, where animals can drink from, such, such interventions bring conflicts between the affected farmer and the other farmers. Also, another form of conflicts that is arising because of PPR and other diseases is the animal raids such that when a certain farmer loses most of his herd to PPR or CCPP, they usually turn to raiding animals from other crowds, what they call livestock wrestling, to replace that those ones that have died due to PPR. And how did we select the diseases for ranking? Um, the exercise started with us asking the farmers to list they are the most common diseases in their areas. And after they listed and ranked using special, using simple, using, pro, using simple ranking, they identified their top six diseases. And these are the diseases that we now scored during the proportional piling for morbidity and mortality. And that is why you're seeing CCPP, anaplasmosis and others. So the list came from the farmers themselves. I think there's a, another question in the Q&A about um, bias in the study. So yeah, it's a bit a broad question, but could you identify some sources of bias that might have been there in your, in your study? Yeah, the sources of bias I could think of in this study, especially on the side of the participatory epidemiology part, is um, since we were asking farmers to recall what happened during the course of one a period of one year, so there could be could have been recall bias among the participants, and some of them could have would have thought that we were going to bring in some interventions. So they usually try to make sure that they bring PPR and highlight it as something so big in the community. So that's what I can think of. But also when you look at the triangulation we did with the laboratory investigation, it kind of proves that what they were telling us was true because we saw the prevalence was really high. This follows on to the next question from Una about um, your experience of conducting the particip participatory epidemiology and whether any specific challenges. Oh well, yes, um, conducting the participatory epidemiology. Okay, let me talk about the whole study because we actually did both the sampling and the participatory epidemiology within the same time. And knowing that there was a COVID outbreak at that time, first of all, we, it was very difficult for us to interact with the communities extensively because you had to also take precautions. Uh, sometimes, um, and then me not being able to understand certain things that they were saying, language barrier, because I don't come from that region. However, I had, um, uh, a translator who is a native of that region and has a background in animal health. So she was able to help me during the, the, the engagement with the communities. Uh, we had little time to conduct the 22 focus 
focus group discussions and at times the farmers got tired because some of the questionnaires were really long but of course we encouraged them and let them know that this was going to help them and their animals because we would forward the results to the district and help in uh, planning interventions to control PPR. Uh, the other challenge was, um, yes, we went, we went to conduct this assignment at a time when the place was becoming more insecure. So that, so our lives were at risk animal raids were increasing as well as some um, warriors attacking people who are looking for information to do with livestock and up to now the situation has not reduced so we had to be cautious during the activity and farmers when you go to ask about the animals they will be suspicious about you yes I think we answered most of the questions and we'll probably wrap up here more or less um, but also from my side Claire thank you so much I uh, really like the presentations and yeah you did a great job in answering all those questions coming towards you so well done uh, Charlotte or Melvin you want to add something no, just to say very well done okay I agree you answered the questions very well well, and now it's up to me to thank everybody, Claire, for sharing uh, your master thesis insights. Uh, also to both co-moderators, Veronique and, uh, and Melvin, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Also to the participants uh, for uh, engaging in the discussion and uh, for, uh, for asking your questions. Um, Please uh, let me ask you to complete the polling. Eh? That will, it's always helping us to uh, uh, to improve also um, the the webinars and to gather your feedback uh, on uh, on possible uh, topics and themes. I would also uh, like uh, to announce already the fourth and last uh, webinar in this series of uh, laureates uh, of the prize for global research. It will be featured. Uh, MTM Master of Tropical Medicine alumna uh, Amber Haderman and it will take place on the 17th of November again from T uh, three till four uh, Central European time, um, but it will be further announced on all social media channels and uh, the online alumni platform as well. So thank you very much to all. Uh, stay safe and healthy. And uh, thank you once more uh, to all of you for participating. Looking forward to seeing you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.